My Lords, we were looking at section 44 of the primary legislation when we broke last night. Just for your reference, again, it's in bundle uh, of tab 11 at page 806, and it's the um, defence that's given to those who have a genuine belief that they acted or failed to act by reason of the sanctions uh, uh, in civil proceedings. I just wanted to pick up a little point about that, which is that, in a sense, the nature of the legislature's choice in giving that, that kind of defence is perhaps illuminating when it comes to further questions your lordships have got to answer. Clearly, section 44 envisages a civil action in which one of the parties, and probably the claimant, uh, is a designated party, designated person. That's the whole point of it. Uh, and in which there might arise, and will almost inevitably arise, a question whether the defendant to the, the action had a, a belief, and the belief was reasonable, that his act or omission was indeed in compliance with sanctions regulations, and that excuses him from uh, the, the relevant performance. And obviously those raise square issues of fact as to belief, as to reasonableness of belief, and so forth. And one can see that that, that whole process is almost inevitably going to lead, in many cases, to a triable issue. Now, um, someone's got to win or, and someone's got to lose that trial. And I made the point yesterday, there's no hint in section 44 that if the designated person happens to be the claimant, he can't win an obtained judgment for his civil claim because the defense has failed. But importantly, perhaps for the later arguments, there's nothing to suggest either that the legislature thinks that that trial process can proceed in a world where the claimant couldn't get his costs if he were to win in the normal way. And of course, if the designated person loses the case and the defense is established against him, my learned friend's case is equally that uh, the uh, designated person couldn't be ordered to pay the other side's costs, uh, or at least that there couldn't be a license uh, issued to uh, enable him to do so. And of course, all of these points arise in both directions. If the, if the designated person is a defendant and loses the argument, my learned friend's case is that the court can't order him to pay costs. Uh, and even if the designated person had an obvious, if you like, cast iron and complete defense under section 44, or whatever other merits-based defense he had. My learned friend's case is that this statute authorizes the regulations to meet, to, to have the effect that the designated person can be sued with impunity by any civil claimant, no matter how um, belligerent, bad faith, mer meritless, without any possible cost consequences, because on, on my own friend's cases, case, he'd never have to pay costs to the, to the um, losing party. And the same goes the other way. No matter how unmeritorious the designated person's defense in that situation, my own friend's case is that something in Samler requires the court to conclude that no cost order could be made against him either. Now, we say that it would be bizarre in, in our submission if Parliament had intended the question of the impact of sanctions to be decided in, in civil litigation, which the defence is raised in the normal way, but somehow had also intended all of those sorts of consequences. What one can see is that they were not clearly and unambiguously legislated for, so that if the effect, nonetheless, is as my learned friend would have it, then the regulations would be ultra vires in my submission because there is no authorization within the act that could possibly permit them to have the effect of closing the door of the court because costs couldn't be paid one way or another. Just to be clear, one way out of those submissions is argument over the licensing provisions, isn't it? Yes. That's it. So it doesn't necessarily go to your the key issue you're dealing with at the moment. It could just go to the licensing. It, it, it was really, my lord, directed to the future argument yes, I'll have on licensing. Yes. Because I, taking my loan friend's case as a package, yes, I if he's right on everything, then the section 44 defence has those implications. And I, I, that's why I say he's wrong on everything, partly because that's the consequence. And it's, in, it's not only pro, not provided for in Samuel, it's inconsistent with the approach the legislature. Well, we have a conundrum in... in Mr. Rubinibus's case, which we did raise or discuss yesterday, which is that 
he, he accepts that the, that the pursuit of the proceedings is, is not illegal, it's not unlawful under the, under the regime. Well, and, you, and yet, uh, he says, well, you can't get a license for the various, various things that will happen in any complex commercial litigation. Um, yes, well, like yeah. adverse cost soldiers yeah. either way, and the whole thing has to come grinding to a halt. Yes, and ultimately, you know, I asked myself the question: Was it, um, was he really? I mean, the, the logical consequence in this case is that the proceedings are illegal. Well, he, yes, if if he's right, in, 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 and actually, my lord, I, I'd venture to suggest that he went some way to saying that in some ways there would be unlawfulness involved in the process of litigation prior to judgment, because that was the basis on which he said there could be a dealing in the cause of action mm -hmm. that changes its value at yeah. some point yeah. even prior to judgment, as I'd understood it. And maybe he's limiting it to entry of judgment, but we'll come on to see why there are all sorts of times during litigation when, when if his argument's right, yeah. the value of, of the cause of action would be affected. So your logic's right, and that is a conundrum. It's ob the answer is obvious in our submission, yeah. that, um, it, that, that there is no authorization or requirement in the legislation to permit that outcome. Yeah. But, uh, and I'll come back to it, but I know um, your Lordships have the point and I won't labour it. Can I deal now, now with um, just a couple of other points on what on the principle of legality uh, and really just responding to my learned friend's arguments because faced with the constitutional nature of the right we are concerned with, my learned friend has two answers effectively. Uh, the first is he says, well, it's obvious on s the face of Samla that uh, the legislature had intended to curtail other rights that the common law would regard as fundamental or constitutional. And it's correct, of course, that it has most, most obviously um, the effect of curtailing rights to enjoy property. That is, in a sense, the objective of them, and, and, and that is right. It's also correct, as he said, that samla has got a, a limited regime for challenging designation decisions or non-revocations. Uh, but my Lord, just dealing with that very briefly, as I said yesterday, the very fact that it explicitly involves a curtailment in one respect, which has to in itself be construed uh, as narrowly as possible, demonstrates that there is no unambiguous expression by Parliament of its intention to curtail that right in any other way. It says nothing at all about the core functions of the court in hearing and determining civil rights and obligations. But it's obviously illogical in my sense, <coughs> and indeed slightly perverse, to suggest that because Parliament has intended to in make an inroad into one fundamental right, the right to enjoy property, that one can presume that it must have been aware that it might have been in also encroaching in another fundamental right. As I say, it, it's positively perverse, and the, the inference is actually the other way, surely. It, it can't be the case, for example, that by creating a statute that temporarily deprive someone of enjoying their property, <coughs> it can be presumed that Parliament might have intended to affect the right to life, or the right to liberty, or the right to family life, or privacy. It was absurd to propose that in, in my submission, uh, and it only has to be said to, to be dismissed. It, it is precisely where, in fact, there is a risk, you might think, of Parliament having intended to encroach in one area of fundamental uh, rights, but there is, uh, and it's said now that, that that encroachment somehow leaches into another fundamental area, that one needs the principle of, of legality. Because one has to ask very clearly, could Parliament really have had in mind when it did this in that area, that it also was going to affect another fundamental right in, in the sort of important way my learned friend says. So we urge your Lordships to reject that and suggest that what they have done by overtly <coughs> narrowing the rights to judicial review, but not anything else that the courts have uh, to do, uh, actually points specifically and clearly away from his conclusion and not in favour of it. And this is not at all a case like Belhage, for example. There, the primary legislation, as you know, was explicitly designed and expressed on its face to make an inroad into the fundamental principle of open justice, closed hearings and so forth. And the issue was whether that deliberate and avowed intent by Parliament to make that inroad also applied to certain types of <coughs> judicial review proceedings, which uh, were for 
uh, the judicial review of a decision not to prosecute in that case. So, of course, there was no place for the court to start by presuming that the court, that the legislature had not intended to make an inroad into the fundamental principle of open justice. It, that, again, is a really rather a trite submission. It's obvious, is it not? It was the entire point of the statute. And the question there was what was meant where the statute had drawn the line between, I think, um, what were called relevant civil proceedings as opposed to proceedings in a criminal cause or matter. And that is obviously an area where there isn't a bright line as a matter of wording. This, this case, my lords, is completely different. It can't sensibly be suggested that Samler was avowedly designed or overtly expressed to curtail the right of access to the court for the determination of civil rights and obligations. There's no mention of it in any of the preliminary materials, the explanatory memorandum, the um, preamble to the statute, and indeed, obviously, in the statute itself, nor is there any such mention in the regulations made under it. So we're not in the Belhaj world, and we're not also in the Youssef world, which was the case my learned friend also referred to, it's bundle um, tab 78. That, you, you, you will remember, was a case that did a, at least look at Samla, because the question there was whether the regime adequately protected the relevant uh, claimant's rights to have the arbitrariness of UN sanctions reviewed and challenged in court if appropriate. So it engaged the question of whether Section 38 and its associated provisions, I think in fact it was Section 25 in that case initially, uh, whether those actual provisions were adequate to protect the right to access to justice for the purpose of challenge ar challenging the arbitrariness of a UN designation. And that case, of course, therefore only tells you that the court was concerned to ask whether the legislature had explicitly made provision that would otherwise encroach in the right to access to the court, in effect, Article 6 rights. And the court's answer, again, very unsurprisingly, rather trite, was of course it did. That was the whole object of those provisions. But again, it tells you nothing to establish a submission that Parliament also might have intended to, to abrogate the right to civil justice, to access for civil claims to be determined. And all of that really is, is a way of um, leading up to the submission <clears throat> that my learned friend's whole approach is wrong in my, in, my, in my submission. You'll see, for example, in paragraph 20 of the skeleton argument, the starting point for, for it is that the entry of judgment in favour of a designated person is unlawful, and they say because it would infringe some or all of regulations 11, 12, and 14. That's the submission. And that, they say, depends on the meaning of the words used in the regulations. But that is the wrong starting point. It, it's wrong on its own terms, but you, you don't begin in a case like this, my lords, by asking what do the regulations say? Even if they're capable of meaning what my learned friend says they're meaning, the first question is to ask whether Samler unambiguously and specifically authorised regulations to be made that had the effect of restricting the fundamental right of access to the court for the determination of civil rights. And that is a logically and legally prior question. It does engage the principle of legality. And it also means, in my submission, that if my learned friends are right, that the meaning of the regulations is what they say it is, and it can't be construed in another way, those regulations would be ultra vires to that extent. So can we move on then, my lords, to the actual construction part of the process? Just uh, before you do, yes. I think another of Mr. Rabinovitz's points was, well, it, it, tell me if we're coming to this anyway. There's a principle of, you rely on the principle of continuity. Now, you say, um, look at the explanatory notes and so on and so forth. Uh, what we've got now is supposed to mirror the EU regulation regime. Yes. Now you say under the EU regulation regime, um, uh, you, you would win anyway. Yes. Um, just suppose for a moment that you wouldn't. Um, how does the idea that you're carrying forward EU law uh, relate to the principle of legality? 
I mean, d suppose there were a clash between the two. How, how do you reconcile that? Well, can I, the first answer would be that there won't be a clash between the two because Article 47 of the Charter, the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, does, I think, as my Lord, Lord Justice Popperwell suggested, and I'll show you later, achieve effectively the same end of the, as the principle of legality. But that's not a direct answer to your so question. Article 6. No, it's Article 47, but it's effectively the similar to Article 46. Uh, Article 6. Article 47 guarantees the, the, the EU the, the effective charge. right to access the court. Yes. It's slightly different from Article 6, but it's similar yes. in nature. I'll show you a bit about that, my Lord. That's not a direct answer to your question, but it's re another reason yes. why I say it's, I'm right on the continuity point. Um, but secondly, my Lord, the, the legislature in enacting um, uh, English statute UK statute and English regulations uh, is, is enacting a package of measures that the Constitution requires to comply with the rule of law unless Parliament has expressed on its face that, it does, that, they, that they want to make an inroad, and they've intended to make an inroad. My respectful submission, even if the words of the definition of the words funds and economic resources and so forth are capable of covering a judicial decision, the question for the construction of SAMLA and the regulations is what did Parliament intend by way of inroad into the common law right at the point it enacted SAMLA? And, and it, your Lordships do need to find for the principle of legality to have any meaning at that point that Parliament has expressed its intention in some clear way because otherwise, one is, one is effectively saying that language which is ambiguous but capable of making an inroad can be adopted by Parliament because one can assume it knew something about what went before that effectively destroys the principle of legality altogether. So just to be clear, supposing it were obvious that the Parliament had intended to carry over the EU regime, yes. you you would still say, well, it doesn't matter what the EU regime is or was. Um, the principle of legality means that there has to be an ability to proceed through to judgment. Yes, because, my Lord, the principle of legality must imply that you would have to show unequivocally that Parliament knew that the regime it was introducing made an inroad into the fundamental right of access to the court. It's not enough to say, in fact, because of the process of continuity, it did make such an inroad. The principle of legality requires the court to be testing where the parliament can be taken to have known that it was in, and intended to, to make the inroad. So it, it is possible, of course, and the very fact that EU law is at least sufficiently ambiguous to enable me to make this case, um, that uh, EU law could be read either way. If, if it's true that EU law is, as my learned friend says it, but it's not clear and unambiguous on its face, then how can Parliament have intended clearly and unambiguously to disapply a fundamental constitutional right by adopting it as, as a piece of continuous legislation? I think the answer at the end to that is the hypothesis is that that must have been Parliament's intention when it was implementing the EU legislation. I'm not sure, well, I wouldn't necessarily accept that, my Lord, if it's not clear. Well, I, the, the hypothesis we're on is, which I know you don't accept, that uh, under the EU regulation, this would be an inroad into, uh, uh, and there was uh, an, an inroad into the rights of access to justice. And on that hypothesis, in UK Parliament, in implementing, implementing it, had that intention. Now, I think the Lord's point is, if, it, if you also couple with that, after Brexit, an intention to continue the EU regime, that's how you get your intention to make inroads into the right of access to justice. Well, I, uh, I, think, that, I think that may be the argument that's put against you. I, I, the, where I would cavil with it, if so, is that if if the st if EU EU law had a direct effect under the regulations in in the UK, there was no parliamentary intention behind what uh, the EU regulation meant 
as a matter of direct effect law. The only point, my Lord, at which Parliament could considerably have had a, an intention about what it meant was when it passed the secondary legislation in the pre Samuel regulation of the 2014 regulations. Now, I'm not sure I'd accept that even is Parliament's intention as opposed to the executives that's approved by Parliament. But if, if it can't be said at that point that Parliament clearly knew and understood that what it was doing by allowing secondary legislation to go unchallenged, as it were, that the, that the EU provision had somehow abrogated a fundamental common law right, then I do say the clock is reset at least when they come to pass their own legislation in 2019, even if it's meant to be continuous, unless it can be shown that it was unambiguous and clear that Parliament intended that very effect. I mean, I do follow the argument, but there is a certain sort of irony in it, because in the, the pre-Brexit secondary legislation, I think you get more or less the same words, don't you? Mm. Um, which were plainly intended to give effect to EU law. Yes. Um, now, post-Brexit, we find those words being used again. One might think the Parliament intended to achieve the same result. So were it the case, which I know you don't accept, that EU law meant that you uh, couldn't proceed to a judgment, it seems arguably a bit odd that the same words can achieve a different result post-Brexit. Well, I, I see your logic argument. You've had my, my answer to it. I, in, in some ways, Brexit is the, the key because, and I don't mean that in a political sense, but what I mean it in is that, that that gave the occasion for Parliament to actually make primary legislation, choosing what, to, what its intention was going to be in terms of permitting in, inroads into the constitutional right of access to the courts. And it's at that point that one has to ask, what did it expressly or unambiguously and unambiguously authorise? And I, I see your logic's point, but, but I, I would also submit, of course, that fortunately it, that question won't arise if I'm right, as I submit I am, on the, on the EU position, which is in, in many ways even clearer than it is in, in English law now. And I follow that, but you also obviously say the principle of legality is a very strong one. Yes. It would be most surprising if the EU provisions had a different result, if they have a right, and a proper right of, to effective access to justice. Um, and we'll see that the English cases that looked at the European rules do effectively say that they don't interfere with the core judicial process. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, the construction argument itself, I, I don't think there's much between us on the 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 process, well, leaving aside the principle of illeg illegality, which is a very strong starting presumption on my case. Um, the, uh, my learned friend was very keen to accept in his oral submissions that one is looking at the wording, but importantly, in the context of the statute's background and with its purpose in mind. Now, he never then attempted in my submission properly to address why what the context and purpose tells you about the wording. But it is important that it's, it's understood that it is, a, it is a clear principle of law, of statutory interpretation, that the context is relevant not simply for resolving ambiguities, but for ascertaining the meaning of a statute, even if its literal wording is unambiguous. And we've cited Benyon at page 413 on that. It's in the Authorities Bundle, tab 1105018 referring to the case of the Attorney General against the Prince of Hanover, which you'll probably be familiar with. It's also in the bundles of tab 28, pages 2578 to 9. But that, that means one doesn't start with the words and say, well, they're clear because I can say that a judgment is a debt and a debt is a fund and therefore a fund must, therefore a judgment must be within the wording of Regulation 12 or 13 or whatever. One, one, one looks at the words, but that doesn't tell you the answer. I don't think I need to labour that point because your lordships will be familiar with those sorts of concepts. And my learned friend accepted it, as I say, as a principle. You, you may also remember from being shown the article by Mr Sales, as he was, that um, it, it is part of the principle of legality that it changes what appears to be the natural meaning of words. That is, that is the effect of the principle of legality if it applies. And the article 
makes that point at page 4986 of the bundle, tab 108. Again, I don't think your lordships need to turn it up. And, and that's where, it just, just to pick up on the point my learned friend did make, there is the difference between the principle of legality, which allows a reading down, in other words, a modification of its ostensible field of application, as Mr. Sales puts it at 4988, compared to an Article 6, Section 3 of the Human Rights Act reading, which enables you to read words in as well. But it's clearly uh, good enough for my purposes to be able to modify the application of an ostensible field of application, for example, in relation to Regulation 12. Because if, if it's correct that on its construction otherwise, the making of a person making available funds or economic resources to a designated person is capable of catching in court, entering a judgment, then the principle of legality would enable the court, does enable the court, to modify the application of that regulation by reading it down so that it does not apply to the core functions of the court exercised in its judicial function for the determination of civil rights and liabilities if that would result in a curtailment of access to the court for that purpose. And so this is not an exercise of offering different meanings to words. That's not something that, that um, it, we, we need to do. We, we need to, or at least our starting point is that one can read it down in that way and modify its ostensible field of application. That brings me on to, to, to some of the background materials that my, my, my Lord, Lord Justice Newey had mentioned a moment ago in terms of continuity, because it is my case, and, and, and I don't make this case because... It, it's, um, it, it's a new one, or it suits me this time round. It was my learned friend's case below, before Mrs Justice Cockrell, that the regulations by a Samler were intended to replicate and continue the sanctions regime developed under the EU regulations. That, that he said to Mrs Justice Cockrell, day one, page 98. And he rightly said at that point, I think this is common ground, and it was common ground, replicate and continue. And that is amply supported by the materials that my learned friend relied on below. There's the explanatory notes you have at Authorities Bundle tab 12, um, perhaps just to, to flag, since I don't think we've looked at those, um, Authorities Bundle tab 12, page 846. Um, Again, there's no dispute that these are admissible aids to construction. Tab 12. 846, I'm looking at my Lord. Paragraph 7, please. And again, bearing in mind we're focusing on the primary legislation at this point, it's the penultimate sentence. The Act ensures maximum continuity and certainty. It sets up the powers the UK will need to carry on implementing sanctions as it currently does. So it's continuity and certainty and in both the powers and the implementation. Now the government also, uh, as it now days does, issued an impact assessment of the Act, or the bill I suppose as it then was. I'm afraid we have to look at the supplementary bundle for that. Um, wherein I think we've, we've cited, if, if your lordships are interested, in Benyon and Tab 1, um, authority for the proposition that the, uh, the impact assessment is as equally admissible to construction as is the, as are the explanatory notes. I, won't take you that. That. I don't need you to look at it, my lord, but perhaps if you, if you want to, it's at page 45 of the bundle, Tab 1, page 45 of the supplementary bundle. Um, it's not, I don't think, controversial. Uh, going to the impact assessment itself, Where's that? tab three, it starts on order page 84. And this perhaps is in the supplementary bundle. In the supplementary bundle, yes. Now, you'll, since you haven't perhaps seen this or its kind, um, I'll just show you what it looks like. You, you can imagine what it's for, given its title, my lords. It's, it's essentially to, to tell Parliament and the public, indeed, 
uh, what the government considers the Act is doing and what impacts it will have on various aspects of national life, including um, costs to industry and human rights and so forth. Paragraph, uh, what, I should say, show you at the beginning that I think it's the bottom of page one, page 84 of the bundle. The minister responsible is Sir Alan Duncan at this point, and indeed throughout the relevant legislation we'll see. He's the minister for Europe and the Americas in the Foreign Office at this time. And um, it's no coincidence, clearly, that he's the Europe minister, and he's bringing the legislation in that will uh, continue and replicate the EU sanctions regime. Um, pa pa what I'd like to show you is on page nine of the, uh, page four of the um, report at the top, paragraph nine, page 87 of the bundle. It says, as the government's white paper sets out, the new legislative powers need to replicate the powers currently relied on under the EC Act if we're to uphold our obligations. The whole bill is designed to bring the maximum possible continuity and certainty and is not designed to bring any substantive policy changes. It's effectively the same wording as the explanatory. Paper. Very similar. Go, the, the, the reason I wanted to show it to you, Lordship, was there's a, there's a further section, if we can go all the way to the end of the report, starts on page 91 of the bundle, paragraph 44, my Lord, where the government introducing the bill expressly considers which fundamental human rights it is going to have an impact on. And you'll see under the heading human rights that the government recognises that sanctions have the potential to impact on them, for example, there was immediate impact on property rights and family life under Articles 1 and 8. It says we have designed the provisions of the bill to mitigate these impacts, though they're proportionate to the legitimate objectives of the sanctions, which is designed to combat severe threats to international peace and security. We have ensured that there are mechanisms to enable persons affected by sanctions to support themselves and their families. We've also created robust review and challenge mechanisms to ensure that persons subject to sanctions have access to justice and seek swift redress and can hold the government to account. We have put in place provisions to ensure they're kept under regular review. And then there's under the heading justice system, what's the impact on the justice system? The only thing that is said is that the legislation will include procedural protections to allow designated persons to challenge their listings. Following an administrative reassessment, we anticipate this will affect the UK courts immediately as such challenges are currently undertaken in EU courts. The ongoing impact on the courts will be li linked to the number of sanctions the government imposes. So the, the, the drafter's mind is directed by this document, by the need to do this document, to the very question of which fundamental rights the Act is intended to encroach upon. And the very fact that that exercise is laid out and explained unambiguously in this sort of document, in my submission, is clear evidence that the drafters of the bill did not intend, and certainly did not anticipate and intend, that the Act would encroach on the fundamental right of access to the court for the determination of civil rights and obligations, because otherwise they would have had to say so. One then goes chronologically, I suppose, to the um, report of a debate in the committee stages of the bill in Hansard. Uh, and, and this is now after SAML has been enacted after this process, but for the purpose of the 2019 regulations being laid before Parliament. So this is a, a section of Hansard that was cited by my learned friends to Mrs Justice Cockrell at the hearing below. So I don't, uh, there's no suggestion that it's inadmissible. Um, it's at the tab two, my lords, of that supplementary bundle, and it starts at page 73. And it's a very short extract. I can show you on page 82 of the bundle. Again, it's Sir Alan Duncan, the Europe Minister, answering questions about the regulations. And at page 82, middle of the page, you'll see there's a sideline towards the lower end. The government tells Parliament that the instrument transposes existing EU sanctions regimes. It does not add to or amend them. The process has been to transpose as identically as possible the EU regimes into what our law will be, what will be our law when we leave. That's obviously leave the European Union. Um, Can I just make one wonder why they took out, for example, 72C? Well, come on to that, my lord. And one answer is because it's simply unnecessary. 
Well, I follow that. But, but your lordship will have to interpret the regulations without the equivalent of Section 72C explicitly on its face, mm -hmm. bearing in mind that the intention of Parliament was to effect the same substantive continuity, whether it said so or not. I must say, at the moment, my impression is in various respects, the UK regulations are less well drafted than the EU regulations. Uh, um, Probably um, wouldn't be appropriate for me to say <laughs> I agree with that, my lord. But yeah, they might have been better off just transposing them literally. You can imagine the political imperative not to do so. <laughs> well, that's the trouble, isn't it? No, that's the, the, trouble. The, the, the difficulty we're in is that no doubt it was the, certainly the government's intention, if not Parliament's, with, with a government majority, to make a clear, as clear a break from the past as they could, whilst getting the act through Parliament and the regulation through Parliament by saying there's no change, nothing to see here. And so the, the, that, in my submission, isn't irrelevant to your Lordship's consideration, because and that also is... Also the issue about the, their international obligations, uh, and there was an issue about that anyway, in, uh, as obligations in the withdrawal agreement, for example, between the, the EU and the UK, I'm leaving all that to one side. Yes. In the context of sanctions, there was also the international obligations arising or, or going back to the United the Nations regime in 1999. Yeah. So, uh -huh. so that on the face of it, you'd, you'd expect, certainly on the face of what's being said, you expect these regimes, if not identical in terms of wording, to, to have identical effect. Yes, in broad terms, I sus I, I'd submit that's right. Yeah. And, and that, but the, 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 the legislative background and the nature of the purpose of the Act, which was specifically Brexit related, that's a perfect, perfectly permissible contextual point. It does suggest that where there are infelicities in the drafting of the regulations, because they were recast in a, in a quite different form, yeah. they were not intended to depart from the fundamental point that I'm making, that, that it applied throughout the EU time. And if they have, in point of form, failed, that's not an indication that Parliament intended to curtail a fundamental right. No, that's not a point that depends on the political aspects of Brexit. It, it may reflect different legislative drafting techniques mm. between I, this country and, and, yeah. and Europe. Uh, yeah. That's absolutely right, my lord. And one can see exactly why, why that is so, because for all time, the EU regulations have been drafted in the passive voice, prohibiting things to be done. But the UK regulations, we just don't do that here. UK statutes tell people what they can and can't do. And the question is, which people is it directed at? That's, that's an example of how it works. It's always been like that. And there's always been, therefore, that scope to argue there's a difference. But we'll come back to that in a moment. So the, the political background is not... It's not just political, it's, it's legislative and it's, um, it, it, it may go some way to explain some of the infelicities. But I hope your Lordships understand my submission, I'm sure you do, which is that a drafting infelicity or an omission to mention something which we would regard as a fundamental part of the common law right of access to justice, in order to find that's gone, You've got to have something unambiguous and clear to indicate that it is Parliament's intention to have got rid of it. And it's got to be in the primary legislation. So we come... Sorry, sorry, I thought it was yeah. speaking. We come on to the EU regulation, if we can move to that, which, my, I, again, my learned friends helpfully show you much of. It's at tab five of bundle... Sorry, tab two of the authorities' bundles. I see it will therefore be your first bundle. And I would invite you to open it so we can look through the various provisions to see its structure as well. And, and, and in a sense, the, 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 what, what I've just shown you is the material to, 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 to demonstrate that when SAMLA was passed and the 2019 regulations were introduced, they were intended in substance to continue this regime. What are we looking at? Tab, uh, so it's tab two of the authorities, bundle one, and I, I won't, my, my learned friend, I'm sorry, my Lord, Lord Justice Newey mentioned the recital number six to the actual, yeah. uh, 
regulation, which we don't have here, but is in supplementary tab six, page 169. I, I won't turn it up now, but my Lord was right to refer to it because it does in, it indicate that the EU was cognizant of its, in, of its need to respect the right to an effective remedy and a fair trial. Now, those words aren't apt only to apply to the challenge to a designation. There's, no, there's actually no fair trial involved in a, in, a, in a designation challenge, which is an administrative review under Article 14, I think, of the, of the regulation. The, the, they, they show the court, they show the member states when it was in force, that as, insofar as this statute or the regulation does not explicitly impinge upon the right of access to the court for an effective remedy and a fair trial, those rights must be respected in the construction of the regulation. And that's really, again, rather obvious. That's a reference, is it, to, to um, Article 47? Yes, it is, because that's the, in particular the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which is different from an addition to Article 6 of the Convention on Human Rights. And that, that recital is in quite general terms, which suggests that it's, it's intended to refer to a fair trial of anything. Yeah, well, indeed, my lord, no, that's what you'd expect, would you not? Uh, what, what it's saying is that we, we, we recognise that we are encroaching in certain areas of fundamental rights, obviously in property rights, yeah. but primarily... But when you are interpreting this regulation in the member states, you must bear in mind that it's been written by those who recognise that there are guarantees in European law of effective rights of access to justice, remedies and fair trials. In a way, it's a bit like the legality principle, or legality, yeah, like the legality rule. It, it's stating it. You must read this statute, this regulation, bearing in mind the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And on that basis, you would expect if there was going to be an inroad into it, this, the, the regulation would say so explicitly, clearly, unambiguously. But does the reference to remedy prove too much? A judicial remedy would be involved in enforcement of the judgment. You say the sanctions make no inroads into the ability, judicial ability to enforce judgment. That's right, my lord. So... Um, right to an effective remedy is something into which inroads are made. Well, well in my submission, it's not, because this, the, the, or, or it is only as far as the regulation explicitly permits. And that, of course, raises the question of what it does permit and what it doesn't permit. But, but, but you're, you're just right. One has to then look at the actual content to see what, what has been clearly and unambiguously restricted and what does not. And I, I would accept that. And I'm not, I, I don't think it proves too much. It just uh, accepts that that is the exercise the principle of legality requires. If, if, if as I think you're accepting, the effect of this regulation would be to prevent a court making an order for enforcement which had the effect of payment of a judgment debt, then we need to see where in this language it makes that inroad and whether one can say that that inroad is sufficiently clear, uh, whereas the adjudication of rights aspect is not. Yes, my lord, I, I accept that to some extent. And I'll show you what, what I say the various bits mean. But the, the, point, I'm, the point I'd make at this stage is that it is important to work out what it, what precisely the regulation does purport to prevent and what it doesn't. Of course, that is that, that's also obvious. But uh, you, uh, what I'm not saying and what I'm not suggesting is that this preamble gives me anything particular that I don't already have or that helps beyond saying the, the drafts of the regulation were cognizant of the same sort of principles that apply under the principle of legality. Yeah. And one has to look for something clear and unambiguous before the court can be blocked out from doing its job. So one has in, in, the, in the regulation, for example, at page 9 of the bundle, uh, provisions I don't need to go through because they are common ground, you should have seen them, uh, 1D to E to F and G, all of which dis define in the passive way that these regulations do, economic resources, freezing of them, freezing of funds, funds, and so on. And Article 2 is then the dispositive prohibition. 
Article 2.1 is the freeze, and Article 2.2 is the no making available. Uh, and and uh, uh, old funds or economic resources. So that, that, that's the twin approach, and one sees that throughout the relevant legislation. Page 13, if we could go to Article 4, please. Article 4 is about the payment of legal fees. And it'll come, become relevant in a, in, a, in, a, in a while. It says, by derogation of article, from Article 2, member states can authorise the release from the freeze or the making available of funds and economic resources under such conditions as they see fit. And it's over the page in, in the bundle, you'll see little b, intended exclusively for payment of reasonable professional fees or reimbursement of incurred expenses associated with the provision of legal services. And it includes other things like basic rights. The point I'd just like your lordships to note as we're going through this is that that goes both ways. In other words, Article 4 permits both a release from the freeze of designated person's funds, but also the making available to a designated person of funds if it's for the purpose of legal fee payment. So it's a two-way allowance, and that will become relevant in my submission to the question of whether adverse and favourable costs are permitted under the UK licensing regime. Article 5, then, is over the page again. Um, at page 13, at the bottom there, you'll see this provision allows designated persons to satisfy judicial decisions and arbitral awards. So this is payment by a designated person ordered to be made by arbitrators or judges. And this is, again, a derogation from Article 2, and the competent authorities can authorise the following... Uh, authorise the release of funds if, A, the funds are subject to an arbitral decision rendered prior to the date of designation, or of a judicial or administrative decision in the union enforceable in the member state concerned prior to or after the date. And they will be used exclusively to satisfy such claims, and the decision is not for the benefit of the natural or legal person, either, the designated person, effectively. Why, why that distinction between arbitration it's not immediately obvious. The only arbitration is a consensual process, possibly. It, it could be, and it could also be, and I would perhaps see this in later as well, that there is a recognition that if a court with jurisdiction, the state apparatus in a member state with jurisdiction has decided something, it would be pretty odd to, to, to prevent it from um, being done. I mean, this is, the, this, this is a recognition, we would say, of the right of the member state's courts to do their job whether it's before or after designation, because this regulation isn't trying to stop them. Can, can you just remind me, how far is this carried into the UK regulations? Not, 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 almost not at all. We'll see in, there's Article 50, um, Regulation 58.5, which permits the satisfaction of prior, um, which, which makes an exep exemption for prior obligations, and then there is the licensing ground under Schedule 5, Paragraph 6, which allows prior pre-designation judgments to be paid. But it omits to mention the payment of post-designation judgments. So that is a respect in which the UK regulations do depart from the EU regulations. In form, it is not explicit on its face that it fulfills both limbs of this uh, part of Article 5, that's right. And you say in form, but if you have a post-designation judgment, this says that the payment of that can be authorised if it's in favour of someone other than the designated person. Uh, or any designated person, in fact, yes. Or any designated person. Mm. So, so, so supposing it were the other way around and you were being sued uh, and... Uh, the claimant had got a judgment against you in EU law terms, it would be possible to authorise the payment of that judgment. Yes. But if you say, is it in form or is there anything in the UK regulations that would permit that? Well, we would say, well, can I come on to that? I mean, there's nothing explicit along these lines. This is, this is catering for the reverse situation. 
Um, but it's rather, it, it is rather an odd idea that, there, that there's no sanctions-related purpose that could possibly be fulfilled by a failure to fully comp continue and replicate the right to allow designated people to give their assets to others for the purpose of fulfilling a court judgment. And adopting a purposive approach, it would be perverse to not subtract assets from a designated person when the court had decided, whether it's before or after designation, that they were owed to, to someone else. It can't possibly be justified by the purpose of the sanctions. And, and this may well be, therefore, an area where the regulations have wrongly omitted to continue the substance of the regime. Now, that doesn't tell you anything in my submission about, about the primary point, because the, what's in and out of the regulations doesn't help anybody unless it applies to this case, and this is the opposite situation, because we're looking at the, what Samler has authorised in terms of whether a, de a designated person can obtain a judgment. But I accept this is one of those areas where there is an inexplicable omission that cannot be justified by the purpose of the sanctions. Now, you can imagine that it wasn't very attractive for, any, for perhaps for a, um, the English, leg the British legislature to pass an act allowing European court judgments to be satisfied after Brexit. But I can't possibly assist your lordship to know whether that had any role in the, in the drafting process. What I can tell you is that if Parliament intended the process to be as continuous and same as before, this is an omission. But anyway, that, that's, 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 if you like, the other way around, as, as I've said, from the case that we're actually grappling with. There is the oddity, of course, that A also requires the funds to be the subject of a decision. I, I should also, yeah, well, I'll come on to this. But, so it is not entirely clear, I think, it, as a matter of the way the English courts have approached this statute, what that means. Lady Justice Arden, in the R&R &R case, uh, seemed to doubt that it required the claim to be a sort of trust claim or a proprietary claim in relation to a specific fund, because it goes on to say um, that the funds will be used to satisfy not just a claim secured by a decision, but, but one recognised as valid in such a decision. So it appears possibly to, to cover any judicial decision, but it's not entirely clear. I'll show you where, when we come to it where Lady Justice Arden made that comment in, in r and I should also say, though, of course, one thing that perhaps does look slightly odd to, Europe, to, to British eyes is the concept of um, a, 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 an administrative decision rendered in the Union being, being enforceable or satisfiable under this provision. Um, not sure what that is really directed at. I mean, one, one knows that in civil law countries, the public administration fulfills quite a lot of the functions we would regard as quasi-judicial, but it, 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 I can't tell your lordships what the limits of that particular concept are under European law. One, one area where this point might come, uh, become relevant, my lord, is um, thinking about security held in an account to fortify a cross-undertaking in damages come on to at the end. Obviously, <coughs> what's happened in this case is my clients got the injunction and were required to fortify it by payment of what's now £2 million dollars, dollars in the Steptoe & Johnson solicitor account held to the order of the court. Um, and that's, that's there. That, in a sense, uh, if there were a decision many years in the future calling on the cross-undertaking, it would seem quite obvious, whatever little A means in this regulation, that it would cover that fund. Because those funds, in a sense, would be the subject of the decision, and they would be used to they would be used exclusively to satisfy claims secured by such a decision. Maybe that's the, 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 this provision is actually um, grammatically incoherent because it says the funds or economic resources are subject are subject of a judicial decision. It doesn't say 
doesn't actually say subject to. So um, it's, it, it's that I think is why there is a, an argument that Lord Panic made in the R and R case. Yeah. That they talk about is trust claims that the judicial decision is that that, that is they are literally the subject of the judicial decision. The judicial decision says that that money there is this person's money, beneficially or whatever. That's the argument, but it isn't. It, 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 yeah, that, that's rather um, belied by the reference to arbitration. True. You well, well you I wouldn't arbitrate a trust claim. You, you, you might. You, you might, might have to, I suppose. Would, would, well, maybe you would in different parts of Europe, I don't know. What, what, standing back and looking at this clause, my lord, I, what, what I would invite the court to take away from it is the indication that the EU legislature did not see it as the role of sanctions to stop the court making orders for or against, but in this case, uh, against a DP. Yeah. And didn't even intend that the, the, the money, that frozen money couldn't be used to satisfy those orders. Because if there's a provision enabling the use of frozen funds to satisfy a decision, a judicial judgment, it is obviously the case that the regulation did not try to prevent the making of the judicial decision. And that's explicit here because the decisions are both post and pre and post designation. So this is part, we say, of the, of the uh, acceptance that the, that the sanctions don't encroach on the judicial function, and, and certainly not sort of to the extent that could yeah, interfere with access to the court door. Article 6, then, is the converse position, which is where you're looking at whether a designated person can pay his debts. And we're not in the realm here of... only of court decisions, this, this, this provision, derogates from Article 2, allows a listed or designated person to pay both under a contract or an agreement concluded pre-designation Sorry, I started that by saying both. It, it, this allows that to be done as long as using frozen money as long as it doesn't breach Article 2.2, which is, in other words, as long as it doesn't make funds available to another designated person. <coughs> then Article 7... Sorry, just before you go on. I haven't really looked at Article 6 before. Has that got a counterpart in the UK regulations? That, that my lord, it looks like 58.5. Yes, I see. Of the regulation. But the, the interesting thing is that um, it's not... 58.5 isn't a licensing ground. It's a, it's a whole exception. So there's a slight distinction there. And, and there's a, I suppose the reason, perhaps the reason it is in the terms, there's a, the, the other distinction is that 58.5 requires the funds, only permits the funds to be paid under that exception if they go into a frozen account. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm sorry, that's not correct. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of a different provision. 58.5 is the, is the, is the analogue of this provision, yes, not an exception, but the funds must be in discharge of an obligation arising before designation. Yep. And my Lord, in one sense it's wider because it refers to obligations arising and not to contracts or agreements concluded. Um, only. It doesn't mention contracts or agreements. Article 6 includes other obligations arising as well as contracts or agreements, but I'm not sure that 
that distinction matters either. One thing, th this, this provision does, we would say, have some potential relevance because what it means is that the, it was no part of the EU regulation to prevent the defendants in this case from offering to pay the compensation they owe to my clients, despite their being designated persons. Sorry, I moved on to Article 7 already. That's the other way around. Let, forgive me, my lords. Article 6 is, 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 is payments by DPs. The, the, what, the point I want to make is on Article 7, which is over the page, um, in fact, eight, page 18. This, this is the article that allows designated persons to receive funds. And it allows funds to be received into a frozen account in the circumstances set out in Article uh, 7, 2, A, B, C. And those are not, well, A isn't relevant, that's just interest. B are payments due under contracts, agreements, or obligations concluded or arising before designation. So that, that's the point I was about to make, my words. That, that provision would allow the satisfaction of what in European law terms, I suppose, would be regarded as a delictual obligation to pay compensation for harm caused by someone's tortious actions. And that would mean that someone injured by, uh, a, a designated person injured prior to the designation can receive compensation or satisfaction of that obligation after designation as long as the money is paid into a frozen account. And one might say one would expect that because otherwise the putative defendant couldn't in fact settle its liability even if it was admitted and wouldn't be able to stop interest accruing on the, on the liability and so forth. But my lords, if you can pay a pre-designation liability to a designated party, at least into a frozen account in the European Union. We would say it would be very odd if the rules prevented the designated person from having commencing proceedings and litigating proceedings to obtain the very same result. There would be no sanctioned-based purpose in that prohibition, in any such prohibition. And it's confirmed, in effect, if I may say, by C, which is in much wider terms, in temporally speaking, that permits payments that are due under any judicial, administrative, or arbitral decision rendered in a member state or enforceable in a member state without restriction of time. That This is the point um, my learned friend addressed to your, your lordships on, on Monday. Uh, and there is no temporal restriction in 72C. And therefore, the European legislature clearly intended that member states' courts could hand down an order requiring a payment to a designated person, and that the defendant could comply with it as long as the money went into a frozen account. And if, it's not exp if it is expressly not a breach of sanctions to satisfy a judgment made after designation, it cannot possibly, in my submission, be a breach of sanctions to obtain that judgment in the first place. The, the, the one is a necessary premise of the other. And clearly, my lords, in my submission, it never crossed anyone's mind when formulating the EU sanctions based on whatever 20 years of international precedent that in fact someone, somehow they'd been interfering in the core functions of member state courts all along by prohibiting the entry of a judgment in the first place. And they specifically allow the satisfaction of that judgment in the terms of Article 7. This is one of those areas in my submission where we'd say it's so obvious it didn't need saying. No point allowing the satisfaction of a post-designation judgment if you couldn't get a post-designation judgment. What matters to the legislature, as we see in little, in little b, uh, sorry, in the, in, in, the, in the tailpiece to the article, Article 7 1, is that the, the proceeds are frozen. 
Um, the other, the other thing, of course, we'll come on to by, by reference to the case of RR and, and others. So, on the face of this article, if if we were considering this article as a case, your your client would be entitled to not not just to obtain a judgment, but also to have that judgment enforced, put into a bank, provided that the funds that were paid, yes, were paid into a frozen account. Yes. But also, my lord, and this again is something I'll come back to. But one bears in mind that this 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 only applies where the sanctions run. There is the sanctions say nothing about the ability of these defendants to pay my clients any sum of money where my clients are based in Russia, as long as they don't do anything in England or in the UK or within the reach of the UK sanctions to breach the sanctions. Yeah. So if they have got a bank account in another country. The sanctions don't even purport to prevent them satisfying a judgment in this court from monies that are not affected by them. Now, that that, that then, I say these defendants, it, it, it depends on the defendant, because some defendants will be UK nationals, some defendants won't be. And in this case, we've got eight defendants, only four of which are represented here. But if, there, if you're a defendant that isn't a UK national, and you're not acting within the UK or the seas or the airspace, then you can satisfy a judgment however you like in Russia, an English judgment in Russia, because the sanctions simply say nothing about it. I accept that in this case, I can't say that these particular defendants are not caught by, as UK nationals, they may or may not be, and it may or may not turn on their geographical location. But what I, my point at the moment isn't a specific one, simply to flag to your lordships, I'm going to come on to make a point here, that there is a limit to what the sanctions purport to do. And there are cases that show that the courts don't have any interest in things that happen beyond the, the reach of the sanctions. And so there's nothing to say, there's no, there's no prohibition on any judgment, in uh, an English judgment being paid by anybody unless they fall within the sanctions regime. I'll come back to that. My third friend's suggestion is that the, 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 the territorial effect of the sanctions regime is the same as it as applies in the criminal law, generally, because it's on the basis of its crimes. I think the, 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 the territorial regime is explicit in the Act and uh, defined to cover people who are UK nationals, that's to say, as I understand it, citizens and companies incorporated in the UK, people within the geograph geographical limits of the UK. Who aren't UK nationals, but it doesn't cover anything. And assets, and assets within the UK. No, no, I don't think it does because it's directed at people. I, I'll, be, I'll be correct if I'm wrong, but I don't believe there is any suggestion that it applies to anything except the people or, or, or companies to which the prohibitions are, are addressed. What you, what you, you, you would obviously, if, there's a, if there is a uh, an asset in England. And a third, a, someone in Russia asks for it to be dealt with. That wouldn't prohibit the Russian person doing anything, but it would stop anyone in England actually dealing with it. So that's the way it would work. But it wouldn't stop that Russian person dealing with anybody else outside the reach of the sanctions. Anyway, I digress slightly on that point. But my learned friend's suggestion was that little c in the European regime, as you, as you may remember, was there only for post-designation judgments where they, where they might have been entered inadvertently or, or, or in error because of ignorance of sanctions, for example. That's what he said, amongst other things. I mean, he's had another answer as well. But obviously, that can't be the way you interpret regulations. You don't say, well, they, the, the, the legislature put that in in case someone made a mistake and breached one of its own provisions, because that would then give effect to a court judgment apparently entered unlawfully. That, that, that I respectfully submit is, a, is not a runner. Another of my learned friend's responses, possibly a primary one, was that if it allowed post-designation obligations and judgments to be enforced post-designation, as it clearly does, he says that, well, that would cut across, as little c does, that would cut across little b, which is limited to pre-designation contractual and other obligations. But the answer to that, of course, is that the, the EU legislature clearly considered that it was not objectionable to have either a voluntary pre-designation payment 
or a coerced post pre or post designation payment. And I, I, one of the one of the answers that I think I would submit to, to why that is so it goes back to what I said to the Chancellor a moment ago, which is presumably that there is a recognition that where a member state's judicial process is engaged, um, it would not be appropriate to interfere in that process, except where sanctions require it. And the limit that, 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 that this article puts on that interference is to require payment into a frozen account. And it's telling in my submission that it also applies to arbitral decisions, because it does suggest that the legislature viewed people who submit either voluntarily or involuntarily to arbitration uh, should have similar rights of access to justice. There, of course, you get a contrast with Article 5.1a, which does draw a distinction according to whether it's pre- or post-designation. Yes, that's right. Um, so, so in that context, you don't see arbitral awards and judicial decisions being treated in the same way. Well, you see them being... No, you don't. And, uh, you don't. And the answer, perhaps, is that there is some perceived difference between allowing the release of frozen funds and allowing payment the receipt, payment receipt or making available of, of, of non-frozen funds. Because what happens is that under Article 7 is that the funds that are received become part of the frozen funds, which would then be covered by Article 5. Yes, that's so right. There is, a, there is a distinction between the Yes. But if, if it shows you anything, it shows you that the legislature is not intending to interfere beyond requiring the payment into a frozen account of the right of a designated person to receive his dues under a judicial decision. There is that distinction. What can I say? It's a... um, Is that a convenient moment to have a break? Yes, ma'am, why not?
you did what I did. Yeah. We got nine hours to get to My Lord, another one of um, my learned friend's responses on Article 72C, at least in his skeleton, he didn't develop it already, perhaps um, tellingly, uh, is to say that the, 7 to, the Article 7 exception or uh, derogation is only to the making available restriction and not the asset freeze restriction. And you see that from the beginning of Article 7.1. It only refers to Article 2.2, not Article 2.1. Um, and so that is correct. But in my respectful submission, it's plainly... Uh, because no one, until my own friends got hold of this case, conceived that making an order to pay money to a designated person, or even paying it into a frozen account, could possibly be a breach of the freeze of the designated person's assets. So it's, it's a concept that is inherent in his, in his attempt to argue that Regulation 11 is breached in this case, for, for reasons which I'll explain are, are tactical. But it's a concept that is obviously rather absurd, and it, it would be remarkable if an attempt to derogate from the right, or an attempt to allow a designation, designated person to be paid money, would ever be thought to be something that could breach a freeze of his existing assets. Well, apart from anything else, that's the, the explanation, if 
is is in the concluding words of the article. Which Quite. Say you, you provided that the money's become frozen pursuant to Article 2.1. Yes. So, so by so definition, it can't be a breach of Article 2.1. It's an entirely well, circular argument. It is, my lord. But it, I say it's telling. Well, it's it, it's you'll see it in his skeleton. Quite a quite a big part of his piece. Um, and that's Whereas because other articles talk about by way of derogation, for example, Article 4, from Article 2 as a whole. As a whole. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. But wh why is my learned friend then driven to take that argument? The answer is because he says it's enough to show that it is a dealing in a cause of action to enter judgment that is therefore a use of a, an asset that is frozen under 2.1 to conclude that the court can't enter judgment. So it's an inherent part of his whole argument as to uh, Regulation 11 and Article 2.1 to have this convolution of um, dealings in causes of action and uh, using them and allowing access to them and devaluing them and all of that. And it's all, I'm afraid, plainly something that the legislature in the EU had no time for because Article 7 is inexplicable otherwise. It's also, of course, a very peculiarly English approach uh, to dealing with causes of action. I'll come back to it in a minute. But what would be the point, um, one might ask at the end of the day, in allowing what Article 7 allows if it's prohibited under Article 2.1 anyway? It would, be, it would be meaningless. And so that, that's another reason why Article 7 has to mean what it says. But we are working, of course, in a system of law that doesn't that includes all the civil law countries that don't understand the concept of merger and judgment. And that's not controversial. Mm. And obviously, if my learned friend's right, there would also be a, a European law distinction between those, cause, those judgment debts that are owed following the trial of a cause of action and those judgment debts that don't include it, don't involve a cause of action, like costs order. And, and that is an, also would be an absurd way to approach a European regulation. And you'll have, my lords, the point that under English law, uh, a defendant who is not even litigating a cause of action can end up being ordered to pay a judgment debt for costs. And it, so, so one, one can have a, an order of the court requiring a payment to a designated person <coughs> Or things that have nothing to do with the cause of action, merger, or anything parochial of that nature. Mm -hmm. Now, we come on then to Article 11 briefly, if we may, um, and I'm trying to make my points that go to several of the strands of the argument as I'm looking at the actual provision. So your lordships will hopefully bear in mind that this covers a lot of the ground. I mean, this is not pr preliminary. Article 11 is the no satisfaction of claims clause, and I can deal with this on page 22, 21 to 22 quite quickly because I think it's common ground now, and my, my Lord Lord Justice New Eden dealt with it in, in Modsa, that this is, uh, a claim, this is a provision that prevents um, claims being brought by designated persons for all time where the performance of the contract or transaction in question has been affected by the sanctions themselves. Um, it is, I think, in my respect, was mission open to argument at quite at what point the designated person's claim becomes unrunnable. Um, whether, it, whether it means you can't get through the court door or whether you can't get judgment, whether you, your claim will be dismissed on its merits or whatever. But it doesn't particularly matter. This it's provision 44. It, it's, it's, it's what's the, 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 the mischief to which this is directed has been addressed in the English statute by section 44. But you'll, you'll get, my lord, I think, that, that, that we've taken a rather different approach to it. Yeah, I follow that, but, but it's the same It's point. the same point. And it says nothing about any restriction on anyone's right to bring a claim in relation to a, a, a civil matter that's got nothing to do with sanctions. It says nothing to do with anyone's right to satisfy a claim, i.e. pay a claim, that's got nothing to do with sanctions. And therefore, that is why we say, and have said all the way through, that this, <coughs> this is a provision which in itself contemplates that there must be claims that are not prohibited by claim by Article 11 by designated persons that cannot just be made, but can, can be satisfied or upheld, if you like, by a final decision of the court and may be paid if they fall within the relevant parts of the other 
aspects of the regulation. I'm not sure at the moment I see that Article 11 helps you at all. I'm not saying it's damaging to you either, but if it can apply post, uh, after a point where you are no longer designated. Well, because my audit, it also must apply before your, des before your designation ceases. I follow that it applies across the board, but how can you infer anything that helps you? Well, when plainly encompassed within it is the possibility of a, of, of a claim being brought after you're no longer designated. The way I put it is this. What we're looking for in the regulation, as we are in the statute in England, is clear and unambiguous wording that prevents a designated person getting a judgment on his non-sanctions related case. And I follow that, that this doesn't show that. Y yes. But on the other hand, I don't see that it particularly helps you either. It's just neutral. Well, my lord, if there was, if, if the prohibition in European law on designated persons getting judgments was intended to be any wider than a prohibition on getting a judgment on a sanctions related case, you'd have to see it in Article 11. It, it is a negative point. But the reason I can make it in my submission is that you are not just Look, you're not just noticing what is there. For the purposes of this fundamental right of access to the court, you have to find something that is unambiguous and clear on the face of the statute to curtail the right to get a judgment in other circumstances. And if that had been the intention of the EU legislature, any more than the British one, you would have to see something either in Article 11 or akin to Article 11. And it could not have been drafted in the narrow sense that it was if the intention had been to be wider. So it, that's the way I put it. Yeah. And you see that Article 11.2 requires a designated person himself in proceedings to enforce such a claim to prove that satisfying it is not prohibited by paragraph 1. My Lord, I think this, in my respectful submission, does go some positive way to help me. Because that clearly contemplate. The, the, the only person in these claims who can be claiming is the designated person. The burden of proving that it's not prohibited is on the designated person. It must therefore be possible the statute contemplates a designated person satisfying that burden. But if the designated person can't get a judgment at all, there would be no point having a burden that can be satisfied or not satisfied. So 11.2, in a sense, does illuminate, in express terms, the fact that the legislature must have had in mind claims brought by designated persons that could be satisfied because they can, in those cases, overcome the burden of showing there's no prohibition. So 11.2 is really rather important. And uh, you, you, you saw yesterday when I showed you section 44 that, in fact, Samler goes rather further uh, uh, and allows um, even the designated person, well, it allows both parties to raise the defence, even in a claim against a designated person. But that's not, that, 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 that's not particularly important now. My, my key point there is the one I've just made. And clearly, if the designated person under 11.2 can satisfy the court that the claim is not prohibited under 11.1, and 11.1 says that you can't satisfy a claim that is prohibited, the regulation contemplates expre expressly that the designated person can obtain judgment on claims that are not prohibited. And one then goes back to 72C, of course, to work out how that mechanism is to be effective, because 72C permits the defendant to make payment of that judgment into a frozen account if they are paying in, in, within the sanctions regime area. So it's actually co coherent in that sense. But you will not find any um, a clear and unambiguous incursion into the civil rights issue. Quite the contrary. Now, similar points were the subject of the decision of this court in R&R, &R, which I do want to go back to, if I may. It's um, tab 83 of your authorities bundles. Um, 
and, and, and it's important in some ways because, not least, it's, it, it is, I think, the only Court of Appeal decision on these kinds of issues, um, other than mod stuff, which was a rather narrower point about Regulation 11, Regulation 38, as it was in the Uranium Act. But just to recap, my lords, R&R &R was about whether there was anything in the EU regulations as it stood then, the Russia regulations, that prevented the making of an order for maintenance against a de designated person to pay money to his wife, who was in Russia, to pay money to his wife, who lived in England but had a bank account in Russia. And when it was known that if the designated person in Russia paid the wife in Russia, she would remit the funds to England in order to spend them on the things that maintenance is ordered to be provided for. And the Court of Appeal's decision is that that order was not prohibited by the regulations. And if we look at page 4358, please, this is Lady Justice Arden's decision. At paragraph 25, she notes that there are two guiding principles relevant to the determination of the case. The first guiding principle is that each set of regulations must be construed as a consistent whole and in a way that enables all the articles or regulations in question to, be, to have effect. And, and she's dealing with that first guiding principle for me. As Mr. Swift submits, and he's for the uh, wife, the basic premise of Article 5 of the regulations is there can be a valid court order even if it deals with funds, economic resources, um, uh, so funds, because otherwise it would be pointless for that regulation to empower the competent authority to authorise the use of frozen funds to meet it. So pausing there, my lord, that, that is um, a statement of principle which we, we, we urge you to accept and agree. Because Article 5 enables frozen funds to be used to meet an order, it is implicit in Article 5 that an order can be made. Now, we are dealing in this, in this case with the converse situation where the designated person is making the payment, but if that reasoning holds good for Article 5, it must hold good for Article 7, which is the converse situation. So to adopt, if I can just adopt Her Ladyship's language, but, but apply it to our case and Article 7.2c, that paragraph would read, in our case, the basic premise is that there can be a valid court order in favour of a designated person, even if it involves a making available of funds, because otherwise it would be pointless for the regulation to empower the competent authority to authorise the payment into a frozen account of funds to meet it. It applies exactly the same way to 72C. Uh, she then goes on in 26 to note what my, learned, what my lord mentioned earlier, and I confirmed, is the UK regulations don't in fact transpose regulation 11, article 11. And of course at that point, um, there, was no, there was no section 44, the SAMLA hadn't been enacted either. What Her Ladyship says about this is that that provides a measure of further support for the proposition that what is prohibited is not the making of a court order, but the satisfaction of claims. At that latter stage, a license from the Treasury would be required under Regulation 9. There was no need to transpose Article 11 if Parliament was content that the making of a court order for the payment of money should not be caught by the measures in the regulations. Again, we are dealing in this case with the opposite way round, but the principle we say is a sound one. Article 11 can only apply to claims by a designated person. So she can only, the, her ladyship can only have been talking about that way round. But the point is, what her ladyship is saying is that there's nothing in the regulations that suggests that the court is meant, that they're meant to trespass on the ability of the court to make the order. And therefore the absence of such a provision is relevant to whether the court's powers have been curtailed by the regulation. And then at 27, She's, she makes the point, which is again one, one of parallel but not direct application, that even if the Treasury didn't give a licence, the person entitled to the court order would be entitled to enforce it when sanctions come to an end. It will be disproportionate for the EU legislature to invalidate a court order and deprive him of that possibility, which Mr Swift's interpretation avoids. That's simply really to make the point that um, uh, unless there's a good reason not to, the court should make an order if it's the right order for payment of a, 
damages to the designated person, because at least it could then be enforced as soon as sanctions are lifted. And it would be disproportionate not to make the order and require the designated person to wait and start the litigation only once sanctions are lifted and have to go through the whole process years later. Of course, that goes to the point my learned friend's approach adopts, which is to, end, to say you should, there should be a stay now, and if and when sanctions are lifted, the whole process should start again, and the two to three to four year process of getting to trial should, should, should just start again in, in, in X years' time. Now, Article 28, uh, sorry, Paragraph 28 is the second guiding principle, which is important in my submission that uh, her ladyship espouses. And that is that both sets of regulations, so far as possible, be construed consistently with the EU fundamental right to effective judicial protection. The right to effective judicial protection is conferred by Article 47 of the Charter and includes the right of access to the court. That, that's the reference I wanted to pick up from earlier. It would be contrary to the wife's fundamental right of access to court to prevent her from obtaining a valid and effective decision of the court in the member state as to maintenance unless that right was clearly taken away by the EU regulation. And that, in a sense, confirms that my Lord Lord Justice Popperwell's instinct yesterday was correct, that it is part of EU law that there is an equivalent to the principle of illegality. Now, if we... She, I should say, two sentences on, she concludes that even if the order had provided for payment in the EU, as opposed to Russia, the making of the order would still not have been prohibited. And so there can't be said to be a circumvention of any prohibition. An order for payment into an EU bank account simply means that the funds would be frozen. Now, what one there, then, so, so, so that's the approach of principle, the guiding principle in, in Lady Justice Arden's decision. If you then turn to Lord Justice Ryder's judgment, from paragraph 39 at page 4363, and in particular paragraph 42, please, at 4364. Uh, paragraph 42 says, um, the order that was made had the object of providing interim maintenance for the wife. It was the, an order of a court of competent jurisdiction in whose jurisdiction the parties had acquiesced. The order was made in accordance with settled, settled principles derived from the statutory scheme and binding authority. No one suggests otherwise. The lawfulness of the order by reference to the statutory scheme is not an issue. The object in effect was not to avoid the sanctions regime, but to make financial provision for the family. I agree with Lord Justice Briggs that it is no part of the sanctions regime to prevent judges in the EU from making regular orders in favour of persons who are entitled to seek the court's determination of an issue within the competence of that court. Neither the EU regulation nor the UK regulations purport to have that effect. And that, my Lord, is a very important distillation from this court, agreed with Lord Justice Briggs and Lady Justice Arden, that the sanctions regime does not stop the court doing its job. Entry of judgment in favour of my client would be the making of a regular order of a person entitled to seek the court's determination of his rights within this court's competence. And that is the end of it in my submission. And no amount of wordplay with the concepts of funds and causes of action, and even making available, can override these clear statements of what the limits of the, of the regulation on sanctions were supposed to be. And for good measure, Lord Justice Briggs agrees entirely with that. And um, can I just show you Lordships at 45, um, he says, I also agree with Lady Justice Arden's analysis to the effect that it is implicit in Article 5 of the EU regulation that it is not part of the objectives or purposes of the sanctions regime which it creates, that the courts of member states should be inhibited in making orders within the scope of their jurisdictional powers, in that case requiring scheduled persons to make payments even out of frozen funds, and a fortiori where the order does not specify the funds which a scheduled person must make payment from which they must make payment. So, thus the judge could have ordered the husband to pay the wife in England, but payment could not then have been achieved without authorization from the Treasury because of the sanctions. I make no assumption, he says, as to whether the Treasury would have granted or made it, but no such order was made. So you, you're not looking at sanctions when you're asking what, what's the court's role. And he, he makes a similar point at paragraph 49. Um,
49, where his, he, 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 he makes uh, findings about the circumvention submission. But he, ado and he adopts Lady Justice Arden's analysis of the implications of Article 5 as his starting point. And he says there in 49, it does indeed show that it is no part of the purpose of the sanctions regime enacted by the EU regulation, or more particularly the measures referred to in Article 2, that EU judges should, be, should not be able to make orders for payment of interim maintenance or any other orders against scheduled persons for the purpose of vindicating the rights of persons entitled to seek their assistance. And over the page at 54, please, he makes the same point effectively. But he, in, on that occasion, quite rightly, doesn't limit the principle to orders made against designated persons, simply people who are entitled to seek the aid of the court for an order vindicating or protecting their rights. These are, these are, these are dicta of the fundamental premise of sanctions and the way in which they relate to the fundamental right of access to the court. And their authority for this court, binding on this court, insofar as their ratio, and in my respectful submission, they are the fundamental basis for the ratio in that case. It happens to be a case in which the designated person was on the other side, making the payment. But the principles ha cannot be distinguished. And that's why, my lord, although my learned friend deals with this case by, by effectively trying to make a virtue out of the fact that the court appears, at least at some points, to be assuming that the regulation might prevent the court from doing something, it doesn't really get him anywhere because the court's conclusion is that it doesn't. They don't need to engage with whether the court's a person or whether the crown is bound or not bound. Of course, the crown is explicitly bound to the these regulations, the English, the English regulations that implemented the 2014 European rules. But it, it simply doesn't arise because the Court of Appeals approach is to say we'll be, we're beyond that. These don't say anything about the role of the court in dispensing justice to those to whom access is required to be given. On the other hand, it could mean that implicitly they have read down the regulations, certainly implementing English regulations, by concluding, and I would say as part of their ratio, that the court is not a person within regulation 11 to 15 of our equivalent. Because if it were, it would, then the decision would, be, would, would indeed be hard to understand. It, is, it, it, it has to be implicit from the, from the points I've just shown you that the Court of Appeal did not regard them as being a person within those regulations, or at least did not regard those regulations as applying to the court at all. And that's an example of the legality principle, if you like, reading down the sphere of application of what might otherwise be unambiguous wording to limit their application. And at the end of the day, that, th th this is the process by which we say, looking at the provisions of the regulations, as interpreted under in R&R &R by this court, um, it couldn't be clearer, in fact, that the international sanctions regime that the EU regulations epitomised before Brexit has never purported to prohibit the court from doing its job, except in very limited and explicit terms where that is a, a matter of sanctions policy, such as in Regulation 11, and it has certainly never explicitly or unambiguously, or, or even at all, prohibited the bringing of claims or the entry of money judgments in favour of designated persons, provided those claims have nothing to do with sanctions. And as we saw, the reason Regulation 11, well, Lady Justice Arden comments that Regulation 11 is absent from the English regulations as they then were. Her reason is sound that there was no need for Regulation 11 because it's nothing trespassed on the right of the court to do its job. And, and, and as my lord said, that what's happened in, in the SAMLA is that an equivalent style of protection has been given to defendants in Section 44.
And even though 72C itself hasn't been carried through, in, and just as Article 11 hasn't and others, um, there is no evidence of any sort to suggest that Parliament, or even the government, the drafters of the, the Act and the, and the regulations, had any inkling that in passing that legislation, they were changing the substantive impact of sanctions as they apply to the court's ability to enter judgments for people who come within their jurisdiction. Now, it's perhaps understandable that, that you did see 7.2c and its equivalents, of course, in all of the regulations prior to Brexit, because there would have been a desire on the part of the legislature to slavishly follow, or at least follow as closely as possible, the wording of the regulations that were then enforced, because one wouldn't want a situation where there was a scope to debate why things were different in the regulation as between, uh, as compared to the English in implementing statutory instrument. But it's equally not surprising that after Brexit, and certainly after SAMLA, and in light of what SAMLA does and doesn't say, that it's simply not necessary to legislate, to confirm that the court has to fulfil its constitutional rights and that people can come before it and have their rights determined. There's no risk of textual incompatibility anymore because we're not in the world where there is a regulation that binds the UK under EU law. And so there was no need to say in our submission what is the obvious and what is the implication, if not the decision of the Court of Appeal in, in R&R, that, that this court is not affected in its ability to enter judgments by anything that Samla says or authorises or requires. That, incidentally, conforms with what the UK's own guidance was, the government guidance in relation to the EU regime prior to SAMLA and during the passage of SAMLA through the Houses of Parliament. I just want to show you, if I may, in the Supplementary Authorities Bundle, uh, the government guidance that was issued in August 2017. It's at tab four. A, a predecessor to the existing guidance, which we'll, I'll show you again in a, a little while. So it's supplementary authorities, my lord, at tab four, and it starts at page one four three, and it's got a, a sort of picture of the City of London on its cover. Yeah, just a moment. Is this an aid to construction, or is this a point that you're simply saying that the, the legislation did what was intended? Or did what was intended? Uh, it's, it's too late to be an aid of cons to construction of the law that was in force at the time it was issued, because it's, this is 2017 and the regulations are then in force, dated to 2014. My, my point is that it's consistent with everything I've just said, being the government's understanding of the regulation it, dra it had drafted and implemented three years earlier. And I actually want to make a point later about how the guidance has changed or not changed, which is relevant. This is, this is how, it, so it's not relevant to the 2014 regime, but it is, in my submission, relevant to what Parliament can be taken to have understood the regime to be when it passed SAMLA. And the reason it's relevant and therefore admissible, my Lord, is it's a public document on the very subject of sanctions. And it was this, this was published just before SAMLA itself was first read as a bill in the House of Lords, which was October 2017, and was therefore material before the House, before Parliament, when it enacted SAMLA. And it's admissible, therefore, as context and purpose to aid the construction of SAMLA. And all, it's a short point, because this, this, this um, guidance rather helpfully, you might think, had a section called Frequently Asked Questions for the public to understand what uh, sanctions meant to them. And that was in uh, Chapter 10. And if you go to page 145 of, I think it's one, 143, in fact, of the bundle, yeah. you'll see a heading in this section of Frequently Asked Questions, Compliance for Family, Friends, and Members of the Public. And as part of the series of frequently asked questions, if you go to page um, 145, please, you'll see 
at the bottom of the page, question 2.14. And 2.14 says, a designated person is suing me for not completing on a contract. How can I respond to this claim and still comply with sanctions? And the guidance is, how sanctions apply to a situation will depend on the exact circumstances of the claim and you should consider taking independent legal advice. Not surprising. You may be able to make a payment into a frozen account of, to, of the designated person for obligations arising under a contract prior to them being designated, if the relevant regime contains such an exemption. And then over the page, an obviously license granted in respect to the contract would enable you to complete on the contract. If you don't wish to complete on the contract, or are in dispute about whether you have completed the contract, it is not a breach of sanctions for the designated person to bring a claim against you. So that's, that, that's the first point. No, attempt, no suggestion you can't sue as a designated person. However, it says they would need an obviously license to pay legal representatives or to enforce any judgment in their favour which requires you to make funds available to them. And then there's a point about um, liability for failing to act if the sanctions apply. So that paragraph clearly uh, states an understanding that you can get a judgment as a designated person, just as you clearly can under the, under the rules, and that it is said you would need a license to, to enforce it if it involves making funds available otherwise. So that, that is literally in the immediate context of the passing of Samla and all of the expressions of continuity of the regime. And if it was intended to give maximum continuity to the previous regime, it, one does ask the question how long we could have moved from this being the UK government's own view that, that the, to, to the exact opposite being the intention of Parliament uh, in, in enacting SAML and authorising the regulations to be made under it. Now, the point, the other, second point I want to make about this guidance is that this whole F, FAQ section, which is a very large part of this document, has now been completely ditched in the latest set of guidance issued by OFSI under SAML and, the, and dealing with the regulations. So there's no equivalent to this in the new section, but there's simply no FAQ at all. One can't, one can't therefore take much from it, except that OFSI is rather less helpful now than it used to be as to what the public can take um, from the sanctions. But you'll see that latest version at um, 116, tab 116, page 5148. Uh, it was issued last summer, and I think it was the guidance issued and required to be issued under Sambler, section 43, and therefore it has statutory backing. But it doesn't illuminate this question at all. It's neutral. Now, can I then move on to the actual wording of the regulations. I know it feels like a long time since we started the argument, but I now just want to address my own friend's points about funds, cause of action, yeah. and resources. All of that being background to, to, to why we say none of this would have changed the, the ability of the court to do justice. The first point, my lords, is a claim or a cause of action is certainly not a fund within the meaning of the Act and the regulation. That's what the learned judge found, and she was right to find that in my submission. Uh, that essentially is because a fund is defined as a financial asset. In This, this is um, section 60, subsection 1, authorities bundle tab 11, page 816. Um, and I'm taking the similar definitions rather than the equivalents in the regulations, but they are the same in material terms. So, so section 60 of Samler explicitly defines a fund as a financial asset or a financial benefit of the kind enumerated in the list below. And there are some 30 or so different uh, financial assets and financial benefits that are listed there. And, and they are, what they have in common is they're all stores of value, if you like, in money terms or means of payment in money's worth. But you don't really need to look at them to know that, because the word, the adjective financial, is crucial to the definition of fund. Now, what we're concerned with in this case, of course, is a shows in action constituting a right to litigate. The cause of action, my lord, properly so analysed, is a cause of action that is a valid cause of action. 
goes back to some of the submissions that were made on Monday, perhaps. And I, I would urge your lordships to avoid using the word cause of action when you're considering a right of a claimant to bring a claim in tort against a defendant. It is a shows in action, and it asserts the existence of a cause of action. But the bare right to litigate is not a cause of action, because it might not be valid. But a, sorry, if you're saying a claim in tort is the cause in action, I mean, if it's a valid claim in tort, why isn't that a cause of it, well, it, My lord, I suppose the point is it could be a cause of action if it's valid. But at the point at which one gets through the doors of the court, it only has to be an arguable cause of action. And that is what the authorities in the old days used to call a bare right to litigate. Because that's what you assign to people if you want to let them pursue your claim. Uh, I think you use the expression shows in action. Yes. To characterise what you, the, the right to litigate rather than a valid cause of action. Yes. Um, I guess a shows in action isn't, isn't, isn't a valid cause of action. You can have a shows in action which is invalid, which is not a right at all. You, you can have, well, it, it, I know we're right, dealing with language, but... We are, it's important that we get this straight. In my submission, this is what, what, how it works. Um, if you have a right to litigate an arguable claim for tort, for unlique, unliquidated damages for compensation in this court, you certainly have a bare right to litigate, and that is what the cases talk about when they address questions of assignment and champerty, and I'll deal with that in a moment. So I would certainly accept that what we're arguing about here is my client bear right to litigate. If it matters, and I don't, I'm not sure any of this does matter, that is not necessarily the same thing as a cause of action. Because a cause of action presupposes that it, it, is, it, is, it is valid. And that is why one doesn't talk about assigning a claim in tort. is isn't an assignment of necessarily of a cause of action. It might be. But it, it certainly is the assignment of a bare right of, uh, to litigate to see whether the cause of action is valid. And the cases do accept that is therefore a shows in action because it's capable of assignment. And, uh, and my lord looks perplexed. No. I don't know whether I can help him. It, it may not matter, as I say. I ha I'm having difficulty with the concept of a valid cause of action. But by that, do you mean one which is bound to succeed, not just an arguable cause of action? Well, one which... one. An arguable cause of action is a is a right to litigate. It's also a cause of action, isn't it? Not in, well, it's only arguable, my lord. The thing is, you can't get a judgment on an arguable cause of action until it's been held to be a cause, a valid cause of action. Yeah, but, because but if we think about what causes of action, what cause of action really means, all, you know, all the facts that you need to plead in order to make good your claim, uh, entitled to claim. That's an asserted cause of action, my lord. Yes, if you assert all the facts necessary. If you prove them, your cause of action has been vindicated and the court will recognise it and make, make orders. I, I, I don't want to get bogged down in this, but it, it, it may, it, the reason I'm doing it is that it illuminates what is a financial asset in my submission. Because when I come to court with a bare right to litigate a tort claim for unliquidated damages, it is true that I could, in some cases, assign it in equity, at least. And it's the shows in action to that extent. But it is not a cause of action because it doesn't necessarily meet, have to be valid. And the reason it may matter is because I, my right to access to the court, as I said at the beginning of my submissions yesterday, is to bring an arguable claim, not a, not a valid claim. And so we have to be talking about the right to present to the court, uh, to use, if you like, in my learned friend's terms, a right, a bare right to litigate, as they're calling the cases. Right. Could you not be talking about both? Possibly. Not all bare rights to litigate will amount to causes of action because they will fail. Right. But if you've got a good claim, then you've got a... Yeah, I, I agree, <laughs> and, 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 you know, in a way, one would, one, what, the, the man on the club omnibus might wonder why the sanctions regime even gets you into a debate about shows in action. But, 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 but it I'm does, it, on my learned friend's case. Sorry, maybe I'm being um, slow on this, but what we're talking about here is is whether or not the sanctions regime um, prohibits the entry of a judgment yes. on the cause of action. Yes. The, 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 there will only be an entry of judgment on a cause of action which is a valid cause of action. That is right. So, so the predicate is that throughout, as it were, there's a valid cause of action. It, it, yes and no, my lord. That, that is the problem I tried to address last night or yesterday evening. 
My learned friend's case is, is that you can't get a judgment on a valid cause of action. But the effect of his case is that there must be a stay of the litigation before you even get to that point. My argument, of course, is the thing I'm doing in court is presenting a right to litigate for adjudication as to whether it's a valid cause of action. And that process can't be trammeled by sanctions that don't have any, any bite on a bare right to litigate before, it becomes a before someone declares it's a valid cause of action. We simply don't know whether it's a valid cause of action. Yeah. If I can develop the point, it may, not, it may prove to evaporate as an issue. Yeah. But it, it is illuminating, at least on this level, my lord. If, if I come to court saying that Mr. Rabinovitz has negligently crashed into my car and broken my leg, I have a bare right to litigate, and I can come to court and ask the court to, to, to make the findings to establish a cause of action. But could you possibly say that that right to litigate is a financial asset of the nature of any of the ones listed in A to H? I'm talking about A to H, but you accept it's an asset, as I understand. Of course, yes. And that's why it obviously falls within an economic resource, my lord. So, so if it's an asset, it all turns on the meaning of financial. Yes. Uh, Possibly as coloured by what we see in A to H. Yes. Yes. But I, and in that context, why does it particularly matter whether it's a fair right to litigate or a valid cause of action? Does that tell you whether it's a financial asset? Well, if it, 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 it could, or it might. But my my bigger point is that once you realise that it, the right to sue someone for a broken leg, for damages for a broken leg, would never, by anybody in my respectful submission, be suggested to be a financial asset. You, you, you just cut the legs out of my learned friend's semantic arguments about using, dealing, allowing access, altering, because they only apply to funds. My learned friend's desperate for this to be a fund because he wants to run his argument that dealing with a cause of action in litigation is prohibited by those acts of uh, dealing that are listed and enumerated in sub-regulation three. And in order to work out whether we're, we have to debate regulation um, subsection 3, which is about dealing in funds, or subsection 4, which is about dealing in economic resources, we need to know whether it's a fund or an economic resource. And all of the convolutions about what would happen to the value of a cause of action, or a, I would call it a bare right to litigate, when the judge raises his eyebrow and says, you're not seriously suggesting that this or that, Mr. Pillow, uh, and value and so forth, how that might affect the value or character of the cause of action. None of that matters if it's, a, if it's an economic resource properly so characterised. Yeah, I understand uh, that, but the, the, the case that you're advancing is the entry of a judgment, the primary case, the entry of a judgment, creating a judgment debt, yes. is not a breach of sanctions. Yes. And that does involve addressing the question as whether well, that activity Yes. Uh, it comes within the wording of the Act and the regulations, yes. and that activity involves a cause of action in, in the sense of a, a valid cause of action. We know at that point there is, and I'll come on to address that, of course. So at that point, um, what do you say, that that is a fund? No, my lord, a, co a cause of action at the for point of entry of judgment. damages, at the point of entry of judgment, is the cause of action is an economic resource because it, it, it is quite literally, well, I really put that too high, but what you're doing is you're getting the court to give you a judgment debt in return for it. I, I don't want to necessarily adopt my learned friend's language on this, but this is, why, this is why it so obviously is an economic resource because if you've got a valid cause of action, you can obtain a judgment debt, and a judgment debt is a fund. I mean, I quite follow the argument that a cause of action or, or, or what you have pre-judgment is not a fund. Yes. But at the point at which judgment is entered, you say, well, at that point, you know you've got a valid cause of action. Um, well, okay. so, so do you, at that instant, acquire a fund in that sense because it's a valid cause of action? Yes. But if, you, if it turns out that you've got judgment, well, you had the valid cause of action all along. Um, so I can't quite see why it turns Well, maybe on. it doesn't matter, but the, my point is that, the, that whatever, whether you call it a cause of action or a right to litigate or, 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 or anything, that is, in my submission, clearly not a store of monetary value 
of the type that's required for anybody to call it properly a financial asset. It is definitely, and I accept this, an economic resource because it's capable of being used to raise money or to, to, to it, ha it, it is capable of use um, in exchange for money because you can assign it. I mean, that's the, that's the archetypal example. And the whole scheme of Section 60, if I may say, and I, may, I hope I didn't set a hair run, but I, whether it's a cause of action properly so called or a bare right to litigate, the whole scheme of Section 60 is that there are some things that are stores of monetary value, and there are some things that may or may not be, but which you can exchange for monetary value, or a fund that is a store of monetary value, and that is um, what an economic resource is defined as being. So, so all, all, yeah. if I understood correctly, all, your submission is that all of the examples in A to H, insofar as they are rights or asserted rights against others, uh, 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 only mean valid rights. Uh, and and with, a, with, a, with an assertion... Not arguable rights, not, not right to litigate rights, but actually valid yes. rights. Yes. yes Anything which right. is short of that and is only arguable as a claim on a guarantee may be, is not within it. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not a claim on a guarantee in the sense of uh, putting forward a claim on a guarantee. No, it's, it's, only, a valid claim. it's only a valid claim. Yes, all all right. of those are examples of shows us in action in the sense of rights of action in the sense of proved valid. Yes. Which, yes. Would, which would be proved. Yes, that's my solution. Oh, I see. Thank you. And, and just to be clear, though, I see I know what you say. Um, we, in, yeah. A to H are said to be inclusive but not exhaustive. Yes. So how far do A to H help us in determining what financial means? Well, um, I'm not sure I can help you further than I've already helped you, which is to say financial must mean that it has an intrinsic value that is of, and normally in those cases, li a liquidated sum. I mean, not, not always, I, I, I may have to accept, but these are liquidated amounts uh, for these, these types of asset. I mean, and they're the sorts of financial assets that you would see um, commercial people doing business with. I mean, Mr. Rabinovitz points out that a claim on a guarantee is one for damages rather than death, but even so, you conventionally claim a sum of money as reflective of the principal's liability. So, it's, it's, so if it's a claim for damages, it's a claim for damages of a funny kind. Yes, it's not, it's not what, what I would say is it's not at all like a claim for damages for harm caused by broken leg. I accept that it's, a bit, it's not an easy line to draw, but I do urge the court to stand back and ask what a financial asset is, or financial benefit. Well, it's rather an impractical line to draw. What you're saying is that um, if someone looks at this and there's a claim on a guarantee, it is a fund if it's a valid claim, and it's not a fund if it's uh, merely an arguable claim and X hypothesizing one that's in fact going to fail. But you've got to be able to decide at the time you're looking at it, before you get a court decision, whether it's a fund or not, if, for example, you're, you might be thinking of taking an assignment of it. So well, it you, you may, gives may, rise to great uncertainty, doesn't it? You may or may not, depending it's on whether... Greater uncertainty than is inherent in the instruments themselves. Well, you may or may not, my lord, depending on whether it matters, whether it's a fund or an economic resource, because it will be covered by one or the other. And the question is what you're doing, whether what you're doing is capable of being prohibited by one but not the other. But assume, your example assume, assume the activity in question it yes. is clearly um, a, a dealing or an exchange. Permitted yes. in relation to economic resources and not in relation to well, funds. There aren't many examples of that, but there, there are some I accept. But um, uh, it isn't easy. I, I'm, I'm not suggesting it is easy, my lord. And I, but I'm inviting your lordship, in a sense, first of all, to look at what a financial asset is. And if your lordship thinks that a person who uh, has a broken leg has a financial asset, then that is the answer, and I would urge you to say it's not. One of the reasons it's not, my lord, is because if it's right, and I was a designated person, and Mr. Rabinovitz came and punched me in the face, he'd be making available a fund. Yes, but the point you're making, um fits with your submission 
But what we need to focus on is not whether they're assets, but whether they're financial, financial assets. assets. Yes. But the solution to that that you propose has nothing to do with the nature of the claim. It is whether it is an arguable claim or a valid claim. Well, or, or it's a claim, or it's a, it's a financial claim. But you, you may, let's leave that to one side. Maybe I'm wrong about that. But what they have in common is that there are monetary claims for sums of cash or cash as value. So let's assume that my Lord's right and, and, and that a guarantee, a claim on a guarantee, is, is a financial asset, even though it's not necessarily valid. But at least if you assert a claim under a guarantee, you say, I, you owe me a, a million pounds, and that is a financial asset, a financial benefit to me. And that clearly would fall within the fund. If, if, if you come along with a broken leg and say, I want damages, you haven't got a financial asset of that kind at all. You've got an, a claim to be awarded compensation for a non-financial harm. That can't be a financial asset in my submission. Let's just forget about the broken leg. What about the claim in the present case? Well, the claim in the present case really, is the same as what we're really talking about. Well, the claim in the present case is a claim, let's say, for um, conspiracy, yes. uh, which has caused uh, your clients uh, major financial loss. Yes. So it's, it's, it, it is a financial claim. It, it, it is a financial claim, but so is a claim for a broken leg. In that sense, I, 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 I agree. One thing I would say is it can't possibly depend on the nature of the harm you've suffered, whether your claim is a financial benefit or loss or, 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 or asset or not. Now, well, you may say, well, that means the, they're all financial assets. The, the, the layman or the tabloid press might characterise this as a claim that um, they've stolen your money. Well, well, yes, but you, Lordship has to test it by assuming I'm here with a broken leg. Does that, is that not very, does that sound rather financial? No. You've stolen my money? No, it, it sounds rather like... to be compensated? sounds rather like an economic resource in the sense that the statute uses that expression. Because it has to be treated. All I'm saying, my lord, you cannot, in my submission, approach this by saying my claim is different from the broken leg claim. They either both have to be funds or they both have to be economic resources. And one of the oddities, as I've said, is that if a designated, let's assume someone hates um, designated Russian people, and there's, in the street outside the court, uh, someone punches a designated person in the face. The designate, they know the designated person will be able to sue them for it and recover the harm caused. On my learned friend's interpretation, that would be uh, a, a fu uh, making available of a fund to a designated person within the meaning of this statute. Can that really be? Now, I think one thing that is clear, of course, is that funds does not capture every kind of obvious asset. I mean, it doesn't capture a house, for example. No. Um, so you have to distinguish between assets that are deemed financial benefits, uh, uh, such as to be funds, and other assets. And you say you're on the other assets side of the line. Yes, well, can, well, that's maybe illuminating, my lord. Um, a house. I would say my house is one of my biggest financial asset, um, perhaps, because that's what, that's what, it's, what, it's worth a certain amount of money. But there is no doubt, as my Lord, Lord Justice News says, it's not a, it's not a fund, no. nor is the field next door. And, and that, in a sense, cap encapsulates the point I'm trying to get at, which is that a, a house may be worth X or may be worth Y, it all depends on this or that, but it's not got a an assertable monetary value that is objectively ascertainable by some kind of cash. For example, a guarantee will have a value because it will say you will guarantee this obligation and the, value, the obligation will be X million or Y million. It's not an easy distinction to draw, but if, 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 if a house isn't a financial asset, a claim for a broken leg certainly isn't a financial asset. Uh, and, and that's, I'm afraid, the best I can do to help you with chips. I actually, can this I doesn't matter. Sorry. Yeah. Can, can I just put something else to you? I was intrigued by the fact you've got bills of lading there. Yeah, I know. I was going to ask um, about those. <laughs> which, um, are, insofar as they're assets, one thinks, well, that's, that's because they're documents of title, which entitle you to physical 
goods sometimes. No, the physical goods aren't uh, funds, they're economic assets. Um, so why are bills of lading there? It may well be because they're often used by way of pledge to banks and used therefore for what might be thought to be a financial purpose in, in that sense, which, which may suggest that at least in part what these categories are looking at are the purposes for which may otherwise be economic assets, i.e. assets are, are, are put or can be put, um, which, which might lead to the suggestion that all causes of action will do because they're assignable and therefore turnable into cash. But they're not turnable because my cause of action for a broken leg is not assignable in English law. And that's the answer to your, to your dichotomy. No, no, no but, Whereas, but, but that... <laughs> So I'm not sure that helps you. Well, it does, my lord, because it can't. Be, the test of assignability can't be the touchstone for becoming a fund. Because, but what your lordship's touched on is that bills of lading, for example, are instruments of commerce. They are sometimes exchanged for other things of, of, for value, pleasures. Um, they're, hand, they're, they're effectively receipts for goods in some ways. And by handing them over, you give someone. A benefit. I, I can't explain them for each of these why they are like this, but I think that the idea that they are supposedly commercial instruments of finance through which people often transact business is, is not a bad touchstone. And, and again, a, a, a bare right to litigate is not in that category, especially if it's a bare right to litigate that is unassignable in English law as a, as a personal injury claim would be. It, would be, it wouldn't be rational, for example, for a, a, a right of action for a personal injury claim in tort to be a, 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 an economic resource, but a right of action for a claim for damages for breach of Article 12, 1064 of the Russian Code to be a fund. It doesn't make any sense because the, the principle is the same in the sense that the, 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 they are rights to litigate for harm and compensation for well, if, if, if If the yardstick is something like is it something that you can you can turn into cash? Yes. Um, financial in, in, in that sense. That's, that can't be the yardstick, my lord, because otherwise you wouldn't need um, the definition of economic resources and exchanging them for funds. And it would apply to cargoes of grain or houses or anything. Anything. Like so I'm afraid, and, and the, the reason we've got this distinction, of course, is because of the EU background, to the UN background. There is an attempt to categorise absolutely every possible asset into both types of, into either type of fund or economic resource. You have to draw the line somewhere. I don't, it doesn't matter to my case at the end of the day if I'm right about what you can and can't do with a fund, but I was trying to isolate the argument so that, that, so that you can see that if it is a fund, this, this matters, and if it's not a fund, that matters. Um, and, and I would say that, uh, that you have to approach it on the basis I've suggested, which is if, if I come to court with a claim for a broken leg, uh, am I, do I have a financial asset? And, and if so, why, given the, the house, the, the yacht, the um, whatever, isn't, it, it, it's not there. But I'll, I'll tackle it on both uh, bases, but it is important that it's, it, it can't, the assignability can't be the relevant factor. I mean, in one sense, accordance with your case, the term economic resource fits very well the course of action because it is something that can be used to obtain funds. Yes. Uh, it's the argument. It's yes. Uh, if it's valid, exactly. Um, and, and that's... The problem with my learned friend is that it's not a dealing in an economic resource to use it. He wants it to be a fund because then using it is a dealing that's prohibited. And I say it's clearly not an, a fund and it's an economic resource. And therefore the question is, are we exchanging it for something? And is that, that, that caught by the um, economic resource prohibition? And I, I, I would say that's, your lordship is right. It, 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 if you look at the purpose of the two definitions and how dealing is defined in each case, <coughs> It is rather obvious in my submission that a claim, an unliquidated claim in tort, is certainly has to be an economic resource. Now, um, I, 
I, I leave aside the question of whether whether an economic whether a, a right of claim that is non-assignable could be properly an economic resource, but the point is it couldn't be exchanged in, by way of assignment at least, and it doesn't matter because it's academic in that case. But you, you certainly you are want... assisted in one way, I and mean, leaving aside the, the point about it being a non-exhaustive um, series of um, definitions, the, 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 the only reference to a claim is in, is in A, claims on money. Yes. And you can, you can sort of understand why that's, that's a fund. Yes. You've got a, it's not a claim for damages, it's, a, it's, a, it's effectively like the equivalent to a debt. Yes. Yeah, that, that seems to be right, my lord, and of course one does not have... And nowhere else does it say other claims of any description. No, or, or shows an action, or or like generally that. shows an action or anything like that. And there is some strength in the, her leadership's point that of the 30 or so different types of financial asset, there isn't a mention of a claim or a shows an action except as your lordship's said. And of course it's an inclusive definition, they can't list everything, but you would capture so much by saying shows in action, that, that my learned friend would say should be called, that it would be an odd omission if it was intended to be yeah. called. Yeah. And you don't need it in funds because the, the harm with a shows in action in most cases, um, in, in my submission, would be captured perfectly adequately by the economic resource approach. Now, Yeah. Um, dealing is once you've, once you've isolated whether it's a fund or an economic resource, one has to look at what the relevant definition of dealing is, and that's exhaustively defined for funds in subsection 3 of section 60, which is mirrored in regulation 11.4. And one of the reasons why we say a, a bare right to litigate a court or a cause of action claim can't be a fund is because it would lead to absurd consequences when you try to apply the dealing definition in section subsection 3. And so this, if you like, is a reinforcement of what I've said and possibly a support. These points all cross-support each other, I suppose, at the end of the day, because one has to construe the instrument as a whole. But if a claim or a cause of action is a fund, my lord, you can't use it under section three, subsection 3A, they can't be used. And I think your lordship, my, my lord the chancellor, um, said that it's certainly correct that litig how, how do you use a right to litigate? You litigate. It, the, the, the clue is in the, in the name, a bare right to litigate a tortious action is used by litigating it. And if, if it were really a fund, that would be apparently prohibited from the moment one tries to issue a claim form under section 63A. Mm. My little friend might have said, and I think he may have said below, that you're somehow allowing access to a fund if the court adjudicates on it. But the court would be allowing access to it by issuing the claim form, by making an order for, for de disclosure consequent upon and assuming the existence of a cause of action. That would be a, a use of it and an allowing of access to it. And that just to be clear, you're probably coming on to this. Is A coloured by B or not? In the EU original, plainly it is. But yes, but it appears not to be on this version of the statute, which is obviously a primary piece of primary legislation. Um, so it's your case that used is freestanding. It doesn't matter whether it would result in any change in volume, amount, location, ownership, possession, character or destination. That appears to be the case, my lord, yes. That's my primary point. Yeah. My own friend's case is that one has to read them together, as you say, because that's what the EU regulation had. But he, he equally says that doesn't matter because using, he says, using a cause of action the cause of action is changed in, I think he said, volume, amount or character by the obtaining of a judgment on it. Um, and so that's how he gets around that. But it would be plain as it can be, at least, that Section 60 is intended to be separate, for, for better or for worse. But there's another, the, the, the other... Well, on the face of it, if, 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 the co if your cause of action is a fund, 
can't even issue a claim for it. That, that, that's right. If that's you're the absurdity. Using the course of action. Yes. Or the right. activist. Okay. And, and yes. And and the reason my learned friend's secondary point that these A and B are to be read together is is wrong is because he says that if, for example, the court enters judgment on a cause of action, it changes the value of the cause of action, which he says amounts to a change in amount or character, because he says it's more valuable now than it was before. Now, if that is the test, and I don't accept any of that, but if that were right, then overcoming a strikeout application... Well, it goes back to the point we were discussing... Raising the judge's eyebrow. The, um, the judges who, you know... So it does prove to offend express um, views during the course of interlocutory hearings. Yes. So, so <laughs> that change the value of the course of action. Yes. So you get to the position on my learned friend's interpretation that anything would be a use that actually does change the course, uh, the value or value, amount or whatever, if, uh, if entry of judgment does. Of course, it's an inconsistent case because his case is not that it improves the value once you get judgment. It's that it destroys the course of action as a matter of English law. So I don't quite know how those two propositions sit together. But the entry of judgment does not in itself do anything to the cause of action to increase its value. And it may destroy its value. Of course, what, what, if my learned friend was right, then dismissing a claim brought by a designated person would equally be a use that resulted in a change in the amount or character of the cause of action because it would be shown to the world to be valueless. And the market would, would know that it wasn't worth buying. Yeah. So he can't have it both ways. And that's where his construction of uh, subpara 3 falls, falls apart. Is that a convenient moment? Yes. Good. Two o'clock then, please.